July 2011. A bomb rips through Oslo city center, killing eight people. On an island 40 kilometers away, over 500 teenagers are running for their lives. A lone gunman is methodically hunting them down. In a three-hour terror spree, 77 people will die. Over 200 will be injured. Just how did one man wreak so much havoc and destruction? And why wasn't he stopped sooner? Norway, Tari Fjorden, 40 kilometers outside the capital, Oslo. July the 22nd, 2011. On the tiny island of Utøya, the Norwegian Labour Party is holding its annual youth summer camp. Helge Haugland is one of 500 teenagers attending. It was paradise, where teenagers could come to discuss, to learn politics, and just find new friends. 4 p.m. I had to go and recharge my phone. When I was in the uh, hallway, I, um, I heard rumors about a bomb in Oslo. Hege's father is a high-ranking policeman in the capital. Dad, are you okay? Where are you? It's just that I, I heard something about a bomb. Are you involved? And he said he was on his way back to, to work okay, and I fine. shouldn't disturb him. In the main hall is Elisa Mira. I was told about the bomb in Oslo through my friend Ege. We were then told that an information meeting was to be held. 4.30 p.m. Hi, guys. Can I have your attention, please? The camp's leaders gather all the teenagers. They told us that we had to remain calm and that it was, uh, it was going to be OK and we were safe. We were in an island in the middle of nowhere. Nothing was going to happen to us. <laughs> Twenty-one-year-old Johannes Dalengiske helps out on the ferry between the island and the mainland. He gets a message on his walkie-talkie. They say that um, there's a policeman who wants to cross to the island. I left this meeting uh, and I called the captain and said, "There's a man, a policeman, who wants to cross." Uh, and he said, "Okay, meet me down at the uh, boat." When we came to the other side, we looked at this policeman. He had a very big rifle, and he had a handgun on his thigh. He, he appeared to me uh, just like a policeman. I didn't think twice about that. He had said that he was from the secret police, and he was going to uh, search the island for bombs. By 15 p.m. The camp manager and a security guard come down to intercept him. They're suspicious about the weapons he's carrying.
I hear gunshots. And I look up uh, to my left, and 30 meters away from me, this guy is standing and he is shooting down the ground. Alexandra Peltre is with Hager and Elisa in the main hall. We first believed it to be firecrackers or fireworks. People got quite annoyed and felt that this was very unnecessary, as we had just been told about the bombing of the government offices. I could see a police officer on the road outside by the camping area. He was armed, but he was just strolling around, and I believed he was there to catch the perpetrators. But I was wrong. Panic breaks out. I, like everyone else, just join in the screaming. People started running around and we didn't know what to do. start running, coming to the boat, one after another. There was a general feeling of emergency and urgency to get away from this island. Johannes and eight others escape. Wait! Hey! <laughs> Wait! Wait up for him! I saw the ferry driving off, and we tried to uh, contact them by waving our, waving our arms in the air, but the boat just continued to drive away. Five twenty-four p.m. Over five hundred people are now trapped on the island. Six hundred meters of freezing water separates them from the mainland. The gunman is at the main campsite in the heart of the island. <coughs> Yuli Bremnus is in her tent. She calls her mother. Mom? Mom, Mom! There's a lunatic on the loose. It's killing everyone! <coughs> She called me and said, Mommy, there, there is a maniac shooting around here. I'm trying to get the police, but I don't reach them. I realized that she was scared for her life. moment I realized that I could lose my daughter.
I distanced myself from the situation, and all I was thinking of was to survive. I stayed close to the people I knew, to be safe. We heard shooting all the time. When we didn't hear it, we knew there was something wrong. The shooting only stops for the gunman to reload. On the north shore, Hege calls her father. He's in a meeting with Delta, Norway's counter-terrorist unit. She's put through to the Delta commander. I asked, when are you going to come save us? And he said, maybe an hour, if possible. But that they were on their way. 5.52 PM. The gunman is approaching the pump house on the northern shore. Lisa is on the phone to her mother. They say on TV he's dressed like a policeman. Her mother is worried she may mistake the gunman for a real policeman. If there were two or more, I could come out. But if there was only one, then I was to stay still. I was not to trust anyone. And then we could see movements in the forest. I hung up with my mum. It's safe. You can come out now. Everyone come out now. That's when I decided to jump in the water, knowing that it couldn't possibly be true. I knew what was coming. <laughs> Only a few seconds passed. No! No, please, no! no! And then there was just a lot of shooting. I closed my eyes and buried my fingers in my hair. I just stayed very still and pretended I was dead. I hadn't seen anything before I got up. Then I saw a lot of people who had died. Hege is one of a number of people swimming for the mainland. The skipper of a pleasure boat rescues her and others from the freezing water. Six fifteen p.m. On the island, Yuli is still trying to escape. She texts her mother.
you feel so helpless when you're several hundred kilometers away from your daughter and you can't help her in any way. Alexandra and her friends have made their way to the southern tip of the island. We can see a helicopter arriving. Thinking it's the police coming to rescue them, some come out of hiding. Down here! Help! 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 It tilts slightly, and people start waving and signaling. But the helicopter never lands. It is, in fact, a camera crew from a television station. Suddenly, a man turns up. Please help us! Please help us! I looked straight into his eyes. Six twenty five PM. A group of Delta officers approach the island. Overseeing the operation is Taya Clevingen. As they are on their way in towards the quay, they hear shooting from the southern tip of the island. They also see persons at the waterfront there. So when they go ashore, they walk straight south. Delta spot the gunman. They can see that he's wearing a vest. It's bulging. So to them, it may be a bomb belt. They order him to stop. He continues to walk towards my men. At the last moment, one of the men calls out it's not a bomb belt. And at the same time, the person follows our orders. But it was really close. He nearly got killed. Six thirty four PM. In little more than an hour, the gunman has killed sixty nine people on the island, most of them teenagers. Mariana Bremnes' daughter, Yuli, is amongst those who escape unharmed. I called my mom and my friends and I cried. And I told them that we were safe and we were off the island. I just told her how I love her and, and she said the same back to us. And, and that was really, really a moving moment. For Alexandra, the nightmare is not over. She's been shot in the thigh and is rushed to a hospital in Oslo, where she undergoes three operations. The bullet had gone straight through and out on the other side. The gunman is quickly identified as Anders Breivik, a 32-year-old Norwegian. 
After his arrest, he confesses to both the Utoya shooting and the bomb in Oslo. In total, he has killed 77 and injured over 200 people. It's the deadliest single attack on Norwegian soil since World War II. Now, by rewinding the events leading up to July the 22nd, we can reveal how just one man was able to wreak so much havoc and destruction and why he wasn't stopped sooner. Soon after Breivik's arrest, police discover that just before he started his attacks, he emailed a manifesto called 2083, a European Declaration of Independence, to more than a thousand right-wing individuals across the world. The document is a chilling account of how he meticulously prepared his attack on Norway's liberal elite. His main target is the ruling Labour Party, which he accuses of allowing Muslim extremists to overrun the country. Leading security analyst Helga Lourdes has been investigating how Breivik planned his deadly attacks. It seems quite likely that uh, Breivik was uh, inspired by some of the techniques and methods that uh, jihadists and radical groups have been employing in South and Central Asia, especially in Pakistan, Afghanistan and India. Copying the tactics of his enemy, Breivik will create widespread chaos with multiple attacks that divert and confuse the security forces. First, he is to bomb the Prime Minister's head office in the center of Oslo. The bomb will devastate government and facilitate stage two of his plan. With a security alert at the heart of government, the Labour Youth Group will welcome an armed police officer onto the island of Utoya. There are many elements that need to fall in place in order to be able to carry out such an act. He had the ability to foresee what would happen and how in his own words, difficult it would be to carry out. 3 p.m. on the day of the attack. Breivik drives a white van to the government quarter in central Oslo. Security guard Tor Inga Christofferson is monitoring CCTV cameras from the basement of the government offices. We have to move cars from that area every day. Breivik parks the van right outside the main entrance to the Prime Minister's office and Justice Department. It's not allowed to, to stand there, so we always uh, try to find the driver and move the car. So um, I rewind the video uh, recordings, and um, I saw a guy come out of the car. It looked to me that he was uh, wearing a private security guard uniform. Uh, I then start looking after him with the uh, cameras and I couldn't find him. Two streets away, Andreas Olsen is on his way home. And I saw uh, uh, what I perceived to be a policeman uh, coming towards me on my uh, right. He had a helmet. I saw a badge uh, on his clothes. Minutes later, he sees the same man driving away in a silver car. And that was when I became suspicious because he drove in the wrong direction, in, a, in the one-way street. And I uh, wrote down the plate number. 3.22 p.m. Back at the CCTV control room, Tor zooms in on the van to see if there are any identifying marks. As I zoomed in on the number plate, the car exploded. Oh, 
the bomb rips through the government buildings, creating total chaos. Eight people are killed. Over 200 are injured. When he hears about the explosion, Andreas makes the connection. I thought, OK, this is something I should notify the police about. This might be a relevant observation. The police now have a description of a suspect, as well as details of his car and number plate. Concerned about the possibility of further explosions, the police announce an evacuation with no cordon or checkpoints to stop him. Breivik is able to slip away to his second target, Utoya. Phase one of his plan has succeeded. Police union leader Arne Johansson has been analyzing the security failings that allowed a bomb to be planted on the prime minister's doorstep. We are very naive when it comes to believing that huge tragedies never strike Norway, only others. In the West, most government buildings are heavily guarded and inaccessible to the public. No other countries besides Norway would have such low levels of security for their important buildings. We are very proud of being an open society in which everyone can move around freely where everyone can just go straight into the politicians. In the wake of 9-11, Norway is leaving itself wide open to a terrorist atrocity. In 2006, a security review acknowledges that government buildings in Oslo are particularly vulnerable. A local news report shot at the time proves chillingly prophetic. Ingen utenfor høyblokka i regjeringskvartalet er ikke direkte avskrekkende. Hvem som helst kan sette fra seg en bil full av sprengstoff foran regjeringsbygget. The government decided to close the main access road to the public. But five years after the report, local authorities are still working to close the road to traffic. I think it's a completely absurd situation that we have waited years to get such a very simple political decision for them to close off a street. Johansson believes the delay epitomizes Norway's complacency and lack of urgency when it comes to security issues. I would call it paralysis, political paralysis. Nobody really wants to assume responsibility. On July the 22nd, 2011, the road is still open. Breivik is able to park his truck bomb right outside the Prime Minister's office. But for Breivik's plan to succeed, the bomb needs to be large enough to cause destruction on a massive scale. He decides to construct a 950 kilogram fertilizer bomb. To finance its construction, he produces and sells fake university diplomas over the internet, generating more than 600,000 US dollars, which he hides in bank accounts around the world. In May 2009, he sets up a farm business to act as a front for making a fertilizer bomb. It allows him to purchase six tons of fertilizer without raising suspicion. Being a farmer, uh, you can, or up till July 2011, acquire fertilizers. There is no background check. But one of his purchases does alert the authorities. In December 2010, he buys a component for a detonator, sodium nitrate, from a Polish chemical supplier. The supplier is on the watch list of Global Shield, an international customs corporation that tracks the trade of dangerous chemicals. Eight months before the attacks, Global Shield sends a report to Norway's police intelligence, the PST. 
It includes a list of Norwegians that purchased potentially dangerous chemicals from Poland. They got 41 names from the customs authorities, and Breivik's name was one of those 41. The PST case handler goes on leave shortly after receiving the report. Breivik is not interviewed, and he's not placed on any intelligence register. Had he been kept on a watch list, that might have given uh, the PST some additional information so it would be legally and operationally justified to go further in the searches of Breivik. Breivik makes further purchases of dangerous chemicals from Poland. Had intelligence been aware of these, they might have started an investigation. Instead, Loris believes it's likely that Breivik fell off the intelligence radar. If additional information is not arrived within those four months, they are required to actually uh, discard information. Breivik's purchases do not trigger an investigation. He's free to make his bomb completely unopposed. The next time Breivik is flagged as a risk is when he attempts to buy guns, an automatic rifle and a Glock pistol. Hunting in Norway is a quite common activity, which means also that uh, a lot of people own their own rifles. But hunters have little need for a Glock. In order to get a license to buy such a weapon, uh, he needs to practice on a regular basis with a a sports club, a pistol club. From November 2010 to January 2011, Breivik attends 15 training sessions at a pistol club in Oslo. He applies for the purchase of a Glock. It was initially actually rejected by the police. Uh, they contacted uh, Breivik, uh, asking for additional information. Breivik explains that he's preparing for a competition that has changed its rules to include such caliber guns. The story is confirmed by the pistol club. The last chance to stop Breivik before the attack now slips through the police's fingers. It's now left to Norway security services to stop him on the day of the attack. With the bomb successfully detonated, everything hinges on their response to the assault on Utoya Island. But an hour after the first victim is shot, the police still haven't arrived. Every minute actually counted. The way he willingly let himself be captured means the police would have been able to stop the killing that very moment that they actually engaged Breivik. The chilling fact is that Breivik could have been arrested earlier had it not been for police transport and communication problems. Once the first shots are fired, calls begin to flood into the police. But there's a problem. In Norway, calls to the emergency number are diverted not to a central switchboard, but to local police stations. In this case, Honifoss. The centre has two incoming lines, and it is therefore possible to answer two calls at the same time. However, the number of calls was extremely high, so we opened more lines. Then we could see there were 40 calls waiting. I tried to call the police three times, but I didn't reach them. So I felt, I felt like a little bit lost because nobody could hear us, and I thought maybe the police didn't get a message. 
some calls do get through. And nine minutes after the first shot is fired, Delta, Norway's elite police force, are alerted. They're in Oslo, helping secure the bomb site. Now it's vital they reach Utøya swiftly and apprehend Breivik. But the island is 40 kilometers away, and Delta have to fight through rush hour traffic and contend with windy country roads. It'll take them over half an hour to get there. All the while, the young people on the island are defenseless. Locals across from the island hear the gunshots and struggle to understand why there is no police response. Hope Putin comes soon. Hvorfor er det ikke noen sirener eller noe som helst der? In fact, two police officers are at the ferry dock. They're armed and have the authority to tackle any gunman. Delta Force are desperately trying to get in contact with them. It's extremely important for us to get in touch with the local police district so we can be told a place to turn up. We tried repeatedly, but it wasn't possible. The problem is that Norway's emergency communication system is in the process of being upgraded from analog to digital. In July 2011, Delta are on the new digital system whilst the local police are on the old analog system. We are transferred to the local line of communication, but it was very poor quality. So it was almost impossible to hear what was going on. With local police and Delta in only sporadic contact, vital information is not communicated. There was a mixed view on whether there were one or several perpetrators. From the ferry dock, the officers believe the gunshots come from one gunman. But Delta are in direct contact with teenagers on the island and have additional information. The second in command, he asked me uh, if I had seen the person if I knew how many there were. The sound of each bullet Breivik fires echoes around the island. The terrified teenagers think they hear more than one perpetrator. I just told him that I, the rumors that I heard, that there were four people shooting and that it was police officers. We had understood the situation was that there would be three to five perpetrators on the island. As a result, the local police who could have stopped Breivik's rampage are ordered to wait for Delta backup. This failure to correctly estimate the threat level has tragic consequences. Believing they face multiple gunmen, Delta decide to swamp the island with 23 armed officers. With the main ferry still missing, they must rely on the local police boat to get to the island. We have one police boat at Nordra Buskerud Police District. In their eagerness to help, many boarded the boat. The boat has 10 seats, and the number of people on board was too high. After 200 meters, the boat stops. The boat was too low in the water and took in water at the back when they tried to reverse. This caused the engine to stall. As Breivik continues his killing spree, the Delta officers are left stranded in the boat. They have to be rescued by a commandeered civilian vessel. This caused extra delay and people were probably killed as a consequence. Delta finally set foot on the island at 6.25 p.m., 55 minutes after they were first notified. Now, 
having delved into the investigation, we can uncover the failings that led to 77 dead and more than 240 injured. Five years before the attacks, Norway's government are warned about potential Al-Qaeda terror attacks on their government buildings. While security services are fixated on catching Islamic extremists, Anders Breivik, a Norwegian national, is masterminding a terrorist attack on the liberal elite. Four years later, Breivik works alone to construct a fertilizer bomb and assemble a deadly arsenal of weapons. Intelligence failed to realize the internal threat from the far right, and Breivik's preparations go undetected. One hour, 16 minutes to tragedy. Breivik emails a hate-filled manifesto to right-wing extremists around the world. He then prepares himself a cocktail of drugs to psych himself up for the attacks. Nine minutes to go. Breivik drives a white van to the heart of the government district. 10 seconds. A security guard zooms in on the van. Eight people are killed. Many more are injured. With security forces distracted, Breivik makes his way undetected to Utoya. 5.20 p.m. Two hours after the bomb blast, Breivik reaches the island and fires his first shots. The elite Delta team are contacted within minutes. The island is only 40 kilometers away from Oslo, just 10 minutes by helicopter. But Delta don't own one. They must rely on the police or military to supply them. On July the 22nd, no helicopters are available. They have no option but to take the half-hour drive to Utoya. Communication issues delay Delta yet further. And for over an hour, Breivik is unchallenged by the police. The local police station is overwhelmed by calls from the island. Breivik claims to have called police 10 times to surrender, but only connected twice. When the security forces fail to arrive, he continues his killing spree. Estimates from within the security forces have calculated that the communication and transport issues delayed Delta's arrival by approximately 16 minutes. It's believed that 20 people lost their lives during those last 16 minutes. We are insulated in Norway from the harsh realities of the world and that that uh, caused people to um, sleepwalk uh, into the realities that later struck so hard. In March 2012, both the police and the PST admitted operational failings and publicly apologized for not stopping Breivik earlier. På vegne av PST, vi er beklager at vi ikke klarte å forhindre terroraksjonen. The Norwegian government have increased investment in their intelligence service and have improved communication and transport for their emergency services. Anders Breivik has been charged with acts of terror and murder. He faces the maximum sentence of 21 years in prison. Don't miss the brand new series of Banged Up Abroad, starting with a Caribbean nightmare on Wednesday at 9. Stay tuned for a Nazi Secrets premiere.